Welcome to part four of a series of five on the coronavirus and I will discuss with you this time drug therapy in COVID-19. The first I want to discuss is hydroxychloroquine and I can be rather brief about this. There is in all the studies that have been performed, uh, although there is some sign uh, that it might have helped if you look at the way it acts but all the studies have shown no evidence of efficacy and there is a lots of evidence of no efficacy and there is evidence of however minor potential harm of this drug which mainly refers to a prolonged QT time in the electrocardiogram which uh, comes along with a higher risk of a torsade de pointe, a cardiac arrhythmia. With respect to remdesivir, um, it has shown a minor effect in randomized control trials in moderately ill patients, and this is rather well documented. There is no effect on mortality. The WHO solidarity trial, which is an open uh, label trial, did not demonstrate any significant effect on any relevant parameter. However, the drug is rather expensive, 2,000 till 2,500 euro for a five days treatment. So the advice from the WHO is not to give this uh, drug and anyway, it's not given in the intensive care. And if you look how remdesivir, how it works, you might understand that you can only have minor effects. When there is already a progress of the disease, it is too late to give it. And this is the process of the virus given in this uh, figure. And this is where uh, remdesivir comes in, uh, where it uh, inhibits the uh, viral uh, replication. And as you can see, at the higher part of the uh, figure, um, where uh, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine might uh, have worked, but unfortunately, it is not related to any beneficial clinical effect. A trial with lopinavir or ritonavir, other uh, viral uh, replication inhibitors, uh, has not been very successful in terms of positive outcome. There was no benefit observed with lopinavir ritonavir treatments. A game changer was this very practical study with dexamethasone, which is um, a steroid in uh, hospitalized uh, patients with COVID-19. And as you can see on the right part of the slide, uh, if you focus on this one, where patients who received invasive mechanical ventilation, there was a clear beneficial effect in terms of mortality reduction by dexamethasone. And this was quite um, a clear uh, effect. So the authors concluded that it reduced 28-day mortality. Um, it, it is, it, these data itself are quite convincing. However, you could also argue that the mortality in the usual care arm is rather high. Nonetheless, it will be quite difficult now again to repeat this kind of study. There are a lot of other interventions on the study. Uh, I refer to convalescent plasma uh, containing SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. There were a lot of case reports, uh, monoclonal antibodies and tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 antagonist. There are some very recent uh, data that I want to share with you. A paper published on January 13 this year, 2021, um, which was uh, a retrospective study in over 3,000 hospitalized patients. 
and anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgG antibodies were given um, and they were either in a low, medium, high concentration available. The authors did a tremendous amount of uh, effort to look at these uh, different type of patients and as you can see the uh, relative risk of comparing medium versus low antibody levels in the uh, plasma um, did not show a, a significant result however it is on the left side with a reduction of the relative risk it's just not statistically significant and if you compare high versus low antibody levels and look at all subgroups then there was a significant uh, reduction in mortality. So the authors concluded um, correctly that among patients hospitalized with COVID-19 who were not receiving mechanical ventilation, transfusion of plasma with higher anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgG antibody levels was associated with a lower risk of death then transfusion of plasma with lower antibody levels. And these results are especially present when you give it quite early in uh, uh, the disease and uh, if you give the higher level of the anti-SARS-CoV-2 IgG antibodies. Well, it's very easy to make a command on this uh, study. There were no co controls this study it was an open label study there were quite a lot of missing data and that is not uh, impossible of course in such a registry study and only 33 percent of potential data are presented however this study was the basis for emergency authorization in the usa by the authorities i think the authors did a tremendous good work with the data they uh, had uh, yet we need further information to see whether we are really sure that it uh, works as we hope it does. Some new data regarding tocilizumab. Uh, the most important comes from a multifactorial adaptive platform uh, trial, the uh, remap cap investigators. A multifactorial adaptive platform trial is that you test uh, at the same time, a lot of different uh, treatment uh, strategies and that the patient groups are adapted to what is the standard at that particular moment uh, in time. Uh, so they do not receive fixed uh, treatments. So you use during the trial the knowledge that has been given to you in the previous period. Um, they came out with this uh, paper uh, that is still on the review so we need to see the peer-reviewed paper uh, uh, still at this moment but the data seems seem to be quite convincing with the reduction of the hospital mortality uh, from 35.8 percent in the control to 28 percent in the tocilizumab group. Other studies um, um, in patients who are not on mechanical ventilation uh, were published in the New England Journal of Medic Medicine uh, very recently. Um, and in this uh, study, it was not shown that there was any change in survival, as you can see, read here. Another study with tocilizumab that was recently published in YAMA with a very small group who were patients on mechanical ventilation uh, showed that there was no uh, beneficial uh, effect. So we have some contradictory uh, results. Um, but even if you put all the data together, the, the, the first uh, study uh, will probably give you the most important inference, the remap cap study. But we will wait for the uh, peer-reviewed peer study. Now, my father says, well, I read in the newspaper and I see in the internet and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and 
uh, all kind of uh, treatment claims and uh, they are also doctors who claim this and even professors he tells me and what i try to explain to him and as i as i explain now to you is that understanding methods statistics bias and knowledge of data fallacies is not a basic skill. You're not born with such a skill, so you have to to learn about this. And I could advise you to have a very good look at uh, this uh, poster with the data fallacies to uh, avoid. You can find it freely on the internet on geckoboard.com. And uh, it's very nice to take uh, knowledge of all these data fallacies and I give you one example about a Dutch physician uh, he was in a YouTube video and uh, I, I must admit this video was watched far more frequently than my videos and he was subsequently also invited in the media uh, this physician had no research background he had one um, peer-reviewed paper as a third author in the Malawi Medical Journal in 2002 and he claimed that zinc acetromycin and hydroxychloroquine were very beneficial and he said I treated eight patients subsequently and they were all cured um, well it's very clear to me that uh, if you make such statements you have no idea about the importance of statistics and you have no idea about how likely this is to be due to chance. And that is especially true because most people recover from COVID-19, isn't it? So f much too small number for an observational study. And do understand me correctly, I like very much these kind of studies where, where also GPs make observations and I will never forget that the softenon drama thalidomide was discovered by the observation of a GP of some single patients. So I, I, I'm very much in favor of uh, attaching a high value to these kind of observations. But in this situation, it is, of course, uh, well, not very useful to get this kind of information. And what I explained to my father as well is that the big podium is confused with high importance. With respect to the intensive care treatment, uh, most important is to do all the basics very well. A lung protective ventilation, no fluid overload, uh, because these patients are very much likely to have pulmonary edema, as, and that will be, uh, be even more severe if you've overload these patients with fluids. You should prevent secondary infections and cardiovascular and renal supportive therapy. In terms of uh, medication steroids play an important role and at this particular moment you could say that you could consider tocilizumab and convalescent plasma uh, but we need for latter two further details and we await the final studies. Well, so far this presentation, uh, I, invite, I invite you warmly to watch part five, which is on vaccination for COVID-19. Thank you very much for your attention.